Today, we're going to install an air-to-air -air intercooler on this 719cc supercharged Kubota diesel-powered Honda Insight. Plus, a little later in this episode, I'll show you the progress we've made with our home-brewed computer-controlled fuel rack controller, and we'll likely be making some major changes to the boost controller that we showed you in a previous video. Alright, let's get started. In a previous video, we discovered the temperature of the supercharged air at the intake manifold was ranging between 180 and 185 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's with an ambient temperature hovering around a balmy 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, as summer is fast approaching, it's reasonable to expect the manifold air temps to continue going up and likely go beyond a hellish 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So probably now is a good time to install a simple but effective intercooler. Up until now, I've been avoiding the intercooler installation for a few reasons. My primary reason is the lack of space to install an intercooler where it would get an adequate airflow. Now this area right here is the perfect location for airflow, but, as you can see when viewed from the top side, there really isn't a lot of space. However, I think we can squeeze something in there if we move some stuff around. It ain't going to be easy though. So fast forward a few minutes, and I cleared out most of the stuff that's getting in the way, and now we have a bit more space to work with. It's certainly going to be a tight fit, that's for sure, but this should work out fine for a simple and low-cost air-to-air intercooler. This is the intercooler that we used on the turbo diesel Saturn project, and it's actually a decent intercooler. The input and the output flanges are the perfect sizes for the existing plumbing that we're using. The only problem with this intercooler is, it's too long and it won't fit in the limited space that we have. So we're going to ditch this guy and try something a bit smaller. But, more importantly, the input and the output flanges on this intercooler are a lot easier to deal with, although they are a lot bigger than what we need. So here you can see the size difference between the two intercoolers, but keep in mind we're only feeding a 719cc three-cylinder engine with relatively low boost, and the smaller intercooler should be fine for our application. So putting the intercooler in an area with direct airflow requires a complex mounting system. Now, I didn't want to drill any holes or cut any metal, so I came up with this mounting base that's made from a sheet of plywood and a 2x4. This chunk of crudely painted wood transforms the convoluted opening in the front of the car into a nice clean space where the intercooler can be placed. Now, I'm not a big fan of using 2x4s in automotive applications, but when you consider Rolls-Royce uses wood in their cars, well, this chunk of wood may in fact add a touch of class to this otherwise lowly Honda. Anyway, let's install this stuff and see how it all fits. So that's definitely high class stuff right there. Now let's drop the intercooler in. Aw, that's too bad. Now you can't see the fancy woodwork. Oh well, I'll always know it's there. Alright, let's fast forward through this part and get to something more interesting. So obviously the intercooler's in and it's clamped to the wooden base. Now we have a new problem. You see, it's possible for the intercooler and the radiator to bump into each other. I reckon this may cause problems down the road, the good news is, there's a hole under the bumper cover that we can use for yet another bracket that'll keep the intercooler from hitting the radiator, so let's do that. Fast forward a few minutes and I was able to custom fabricate a brace off camera and install it on the car. Now we're good to go for the rest of the installation. So we need to connect this input flange on the intercooler to the output side of the AMR500 supercharger, and for that I'll use two 90 degree bends spliced together. I think when we're all done, we'll have used every square inch of space on this side of the car. Now the good news is, well, there's plenty of airflow in this area and nothing ever gets hot. Actually, most of the time the engine compartment stays unusually cool and heat has never been an issue with this car. And now we can install the other induction pipe. This guy was a bit more difficult to fabricate, well, because it has to snake over the alternator in order to stay clear of the exhaust pipe. Okay, well that should do it, but before I tighten up this last clamp, I want to start the engine and let the supercharger blow some air through the system, just in case there are any chunks of metal in the intercooler. Stand by for ignition. Well, nothing came flying out, so that's good news. 
Let me button all this stuff up and we can take the car out for a road test. So this is pretty exciting for me. You see, now I can say this car is powered by a 719cc supercharged intercooled three-cylinder Kubota diesel engine. I reckon the more words I add to the description, the more it will impress the chicks. Well, at least that's the theory. The ambient temperature is hovering around 70 degrees and we're showing 76 on the meter. Of course, that really means nothing at this point. Let's check the boost. Now, when the light comes on, that's full boost. Wow, we seem to have a significant pressure drop. The boost should be closer to 10 PSI off idle. Hmm. Oh, the temperature did go up a tiny bit, but there's no airflow in front of the intercooler, so that seems reasonable. So on today's road test, I want to drive the car for at least an hour in order to verify the intercooler works well for normal driving. So with that in mind, I prepped the car to do a fuel economy test and we should have some data to compare after the road test. Now, fuel economy is an interesting data point and while it's not the goal of this project, it's something we can use to evaluate changes we make to the car. The last time this car was driven, obviously we didn't have an intercooler. Anyway, the air temperature at the intake manifold was in the neighborhood of 180 degrees while the car was at a cruising speed of 55 miles per hour. And the supercharger was pumping out a solid 10 PSI boost. At the end of that road test, we found the fuel economy was 69.54 miles per gallon, which is actually pretty good, but it's not as good as when the engine was only developing 5 PSI boost. I'm thinking at cruising speed Speeds, we really don't need to be running full boost. So the question is, is the additional boost hurting the fuel economy or is the elevated air temperatures having an effect? We'll find out soon enough. Now for a point of reference, last year when we added an intercooler to the turbo diesel Saturn, we saw zero improvement in fuel economy and zero improvement in performance. So it will be interesting to see what numbers we get today. Now in today's test, we're actually running two cameras, and of course the second camera continues to have vibration issues. However, I did capture something interesting. Here, check this out. So that's video proof that this car is no slouch, and if pushed hard enough, it can pass a Ford pickup truck. But basically it's a Ford and pretty much anything can pass one of those. And of course now you can see the vibration issues we're having. I'm starting to think it's the camera and not the camera mounts because I keep making the camera mount stiffer and stiffer and the vibration issues stay about the same. So it looks like the intercooler has dropped the charge temps from 180 down to a more reasonable number, so that's good. The exhaust gas temperatures look about the same as usual and that's kind of what I expected. Now the boost pressure, that's interesting, looks like we have a 2 psi pressure drop across the intercooler, which seems like a lot when you consider everything on this car is scaled down. Hmm. Well, we have some data. In the previous fuel economy test, we scored 69.54 miles per US gallon. That's with a full 10 PSI of boost pressure at the manifold and 180 degrees air charge temps. Now, this time around, we successfully dropped the air charge temps to the mid-90s, but we also lost 2 PSI of boost due to the pressure drop across the intercooler. Now, this is interesting. The fuel economy stayed exactly the same, and today we scored 69.50 miles per gallon. It's hard to believe that dropping the intake temps had zero effect on the fuel economy, but that's what the data is showing. Now consider this, the ambient temps were rather mild at a very comfortable 70 degrees. However, in a month or so, we'll be seeing temps in the mid 90s. So the intercooler may actually have an effect on the hotter days. Anyway, I'm actually tempted to bypass the intercooler when we see hotter weather to see what happens. It actually seems like this engine doesn't care about the intake temps. Hmm. Unfortunately, due to the rain, we weren't able to gather any acceleration data, so that's still an unknown, and it will be interesting to see when we get some better weather. So the intercooler works as far as managing the air temps, but I guess we need to see more data to see if it helps with performance. Anyway, let's check out the progress of the various gizmos that we're developing to enhance the performance of this engine. This guy is the fuel rack adjustment screw and it's calibrated at the factory so this engine can more or less run forever at maximum rated power. Well, as it turns out, you can adjust this screw for more power if you add boost to the equation. Now, if you adjust this screw without adding boost, well, you can destroy the engine because the exhaust gas temperatures will go beyond the design limits and the pistons will melt. 
so we do have boost and now we need to be able to actively adjust the fuel rack limit depending on how much boost we have and how hard we want to run the engine. You see, we can cheat a little bit and temporarily go way beyond what's safe for this engine if we limit how long we expose the engine to maximum fuel load. So that means we need to automate this adjustment screw with some technology. In a previous video, I explained how we were going to build some sort of contraption from an Acme screw, a servo, and some sort of linkage. Now, the reason this looks complicated is, well, because it is complicated, that's because we don't have a lot of space in the area where the adjustment screw is located. Well, I'm glad I showed this crazy contraption in an earlier video because one of the viewers suggested I should look at repurposing a GM idle air control motor, like this one. This motor is relatively compact and inside the motor there's a screw that's similar to this one. So when the motor is activated, it turns an internal screw that extends this tip in or out. That's exactly what we need and this guy is very compact. Of course, we'll have to do some modifications to the tip, but that's very doable. Now, one of the cool things about this motor is it's a stepper motor. Actually, it's a bipolar stepper motor, and electrically speaking, this motor works the same way as a common stepper motor that you may have seen on something like a 3D printer or other types of CNC machines. All right, just for an example, I'll show you what a regular stepper motor looks like. So this stepper motor has four wires going to it, and if you apply voltage to the correct two wires, it will advance the shaft on the motor one step and one step only. That's it. So in order to get the motor to advance another step, you have to disconnect the power from the two wires and apply that voltage to another two wires, and the motor will advance yet another step. It's crazy, but these motors will only move one step at a time, you see, the trick to making these work is to switch the voltage going to each pair of the wires fast enough that the motor will rotate. Obviously, the best way to do this is with a computer and a stepper motor controller. So this idle air controller motor works the same way, and in order to get the motor shaft to spin to drive the internal screw in or out, we would have to use a computer. This may seem insane to some people, but keep in mind these stepper motors are very precise and they're intended to be used where accuracy is important. Here, let me show you a quick demo. So this thing is an Arduino Uno microcomputer with a bunch of other stuff attached to it, but basically it's a $12 microcomputer. This guy over here is a stepper motor controller and it's huge! But this is all I had in stock. Anyway, these generally cost about 15 bucks or cheaper, and you can get them really small, about the size of a postage stamp, really. So this is a potentiometer, and it's wired directly into the Arduino. When I turn the shaft on the potentiometer, it will alter the voltage being sent to the microcomputer, and of course the computer will know that the shaft is being turned. Now all of this stuff requires custom code to be programmed in order for it to work. Without the code, well, nothing will work. Anyway, when I move the shaft on the potentiometer, the signal to the microcomputer changes and the computer calculates the necessary data to send to the stepper motor controller and the stepper motor will move. That's the magic of electronics and code. Oh, by the way, this circuit mimics how a servo moves, but it's definitely not how a servo works. Now the microcomputer always knows the position of the potentiometer because of the voltage signal it's sending to the computer. However, it really doesn't know the position of the stepper motor other than the fact that the microcomputer is keeping track of how many steps it commands the motor to move in either direction. Now, if I shut the power off, that'll cause the microcomputer to lose track of the position of the stepper motor because all the data it's been collecting will be lost. But there's a trick I programmed into this gizmo so it can figure out where the stepper motor should be after the power is restored. Here, let me turn the power off. Okay, now the microcomputer is off and all the data it was collecting is gone. And when I turn the power back on, the microcomputer will have to generate new data. So on power up, the microcomputer sent the stepper motor controller a command to spin the motor counterclockwise 200 steps. And that's so the microcomputer can establish where the home position is. Now, in this demo, it's a bit sloppy and some of the stuff bounced around, and it's not perfect. But once the stepper motor reaches its home position, the microcomputer will look at the data from the potentiometer and then calculate that the stepper needs to move 100 steps clockwise from the home position. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this is so you understand how this stuff will provide precise control of the fuel rack position even after the ignition is shut off and all the data is lost. Okay, well let's take another look at this stuff, but this time we'll use our repurposed idle air controller motor. 
Now in a moment, I'll turn the power on and you can see the motor retract to find home position and then it will go to the position that the potentiometer wants it to go to. Not too shabby. Now I have all this stuff slowed down so it's easier to see, but I can change a few variables in the code and this stuff will be a lot faster. If I change the position of the potentiometer, you can see the fuel rack limiter thingy moves in and out. Now when this system's on the engine, the microcomputer will automatically calculate the best position of the fuel rack limit and that'll be based on the throttle position and the boost pressure and perhaps a few other things. The potentiometer isn't necessarily going to be used, however we will need it when we first do our experiments and collect the data so I can program the microcomputer. Just for fun, let's turn off the power and make this thing figure out where it needs to go. So yeah, it went to the home position, then it went back to the position that the potentiometer is telling it to go. Now if the potentiometer were moved when the power was off, well that's not a big deal. When the system powers back on, the fuel rack limiter will of course go to the home position and then it will move to the new position that the potentiometer is telling it to go. And like I said, this stuff will move a lot faster when it's actually in use. So to get this repurposed idle air controller motor to fit the Kubota engine, I designed some 3D printed parts that'll fit the front of the engine and it will kind of hold everything in place. These of course are prototype parts and they're printed with PLA plastic which is good for prototyping but PLA isn't suitable for use on hot engines so the final parts will be made from ASA plastic. Let's take a look at how all this fits on the engine. So this is basically how the stuff fits the engine and for the most part it fits in the limited space. However, we do have an interference issue with the alternator belt. So when the belt's installed, well, it rubs against the gizmo and it ain't gonna work. I kinda knew this was gonna be a problem, but I went ahead and worked out all the other issues and I wanted to see how close we were gonna be. And it's not good. But don't worry, it's easy to make changes to the 3D printed parts. Once I have an idea how much needs to be trimmed, I think I can redesign this with the necessary clearance and still have a robust system. So earlier in this video, I mentioned that we'll be making changes to the boost dump valve. Now, this guy I demonstrated in a previous video, and eh, it works fine on the bench. However, I really like the compact size of the idle air controller motors, and I think we'll end up using one or two of these guys to regulate the boost on the supercharger. These look like they would be simple to design a fixture for, and they may actually be more accurate for regulating the boost. Of course, that's just a theory, and I'll need to do some experiments to confirm that. Now, none of this stuff is really necessary. The car seems to drive fine without any of this junk. But keep in mind, this extra level of technology should make the car more drivable in an urban environment. And that's pretty much the next challenge. And as a bonus, we'll be able to cheat a little bit and squeeze more power from the engine, you know, for science or something like that. Looks like I got a lot of stuff to build and time is running short this week. So now's a good time to end the video. We'll see you next time. Until then.